Okay, so we're going to talk about viruses, what they are, and how they are different from bacteria or prokaryotes. You can see here we got some different pictures of the different viruses, obviously a lot of different shapes, a lot of different structures. Well, let's talk what is a virus. A virus is a non-living particle, which seems a little bit kind of weird. I mean, everyone thinks like, oh, I got sick, I got viruses. Well, if you were to put viruses on either the living or non-living side, they would actually go on this side with the pencil and the bus and the you know mailbox, not on the side with these living creatures. These are, I don't know, organisms isn't even the right term. These are particles that cannot reproduce on their own. There's not much to them, a DNA, RNA genome, and then something around the outside, but they can't make more of themselves the same way you and I can make more of ourselves. They have to infect another cell. Viruses are also too small to be seen with any light microscope. They need about a 7,000x magnification, and light microscopes can really only magnify about a thousand times. Just to give you a little bit of uh, idea about the size of viruses, uh, I've got this really great website from University of Utah. Link will be in the description. But you can kind of see where viruses compare to everything. So, you know, we're going smaller than a grain of rice, smaller than an amoeba, smaller than a human egg, smaller than a sperm, smaller than a red blood cell, smaller than Bater's yeast, smaller than an E. coli, smaller than your mitochondria. Hey, look at that. We finally have our first viruses, 220 nanometers. That is a billionth of a meter. There you can see measles, we have HIV, bacteriophages, uh, coated vesicle, which is part of something you'll find in a cell. And there we have pretty much the smallest viruses, rhinoviruses, hepatitis virus. I mean, it's crazy to think that a rhinovirus is about the same size as a ribosome. These are incredibly tiny and can, God, can they make your life terrible when you have a horrible cold. You're going down a little bit smaller, you know, we're looking at individual atoms and stuff. We're not talking that small but pretty darn small. So significantly smaller than lysosomes and E. coli, so even smaller than bacteria is where we find our viruses. Okay, so let's talk about the actual structure of a virus. There's really two parts to it. It's an RNA or DNA genome, and it's surrounded by a protein coat like a capsid. I like to think of it as like an M&M, even though I'm not actually a fan of M&Ms. There's really only two parts to an M&M. You got the candy shell, and then you got the chocolatey goodness on the inside. In this case right here, the RNA or the DNA genome, that's going to be the chocolatey goodness. That protein coat, that capsid, that is the candy shell. So the capsid is the candy shell, RNA or DNA genome, that's the chocolatey goodness. And all of them have that basic idea. Some of them have additional stuff, sort of the way you get, you know, like peanut M&Ms or peanut butter M&Ms. But in reality, it's really just the same idea. RNA or DNA genome surrounded by some sort of protein coat. Here we can see influenza. There's the RNA or DNA genome surrounded by capsid, but it also has an envelope. So, uh, tobacco mosaic virus, TMV, the RNA or DNA genome surrounded by capsid. Even the really cool T4 bacteriophage, DNA or RNA surrounded by a protein coat. That's it. No other structures. And they come in many different shapes, as you can see all around here. Whether in a helical pattern, an enveloped one, you name it. Let's talk quickly about the bacteriophage. That is a virus that infects bacteria. I'm going to say that again because that's kind of bizarre. It's a virus that only infects bacteria. That's right, it's a germ that infects another germ. And it kind of looks like a Martian lander or something like it. It sits down, it sprouts down, and it injects the DNA inside the actual organism. Here's an actual uh, standing electron microscope picture. They're very, very small, but they got that, you know, head, and then they've got sort of like a sheath there, and then they inject their DNA in. Here you can see sitting on the surface of a poor, poor, dying bacteria injecting their DNA. It's a germ that infects another germ, a bacteria eater. Here you can see it infects a cell. It injects its DNA. That DNA takes over and contains instructions for making more of the bacteriophage and then pops out it explodes to make more, to infect more. Virus reproduction is different than our reproduction. It's not sexual reproduction. It's not asexual reproduction. It's kind of its own thing. They can't make more of themselves. They have to take over a cell infect it, and that's how new viruses are made. So they can only reproduce by infecting a host cell. They're the parasite. We are, unfortunately, the host if you're the one who's sick with the virus. We have two types of infection, lytic and lysogenic. The lytic infection is what I've already mentioned. And then lytic infection, the virus enters the cell, makes a whole bunch of copies of itself, and causes that cell to burst, just like that. So think of it this way. 
You have an outlaw coming to town and eliminate that town's authority. First thing he does, get rid of the sheriff. Well, that's like a virus destroying the host cell's DNA. Next thing he's going to do is he's going to demand that the citizens, the villagers, give him arms, give him equipment. This is how the virus uses the host cell to make new virus parts. And then finally, he forms a new gang and he moves on to a new town. This is how the host cell bursts, releasing hundreds of virus particles, each of them going off to infect another cell. So here we have our unsuspecting cell, and he's infected by viruses. I'm going to make some protein and do some stuff and be awesome. And then, wait a minute, something's wrong. The viral DNA is starting to take over. He's no longer an unsuspecting cell. He's now suspecting. And he's like, oh, no, it's too late. And this is, you know, he's swearing and cursing because he's being taken over by viruses. And then I, I didn't want to really show you. It's, it's horrible. Just, you know, cell parts and organelles everywhere. He died. I'm, I'm sorry. didn't. He died. He's gone. He popped. Lytic infection at its worst. Lysogenic infection, on the other hand, is a little different. In a lysogenic infection, the virus DNA combines with the host DNA and is replicated along with it. The host cell lives, but it's infected and can become lytic later. So in the lysogenic cycle, here's our bacteriophage. It injects its DNA, but the DNA doesn't take over. It just sits and waits and it can become lytic later. This is something like a herpes simplex virus, like a cold sore. You know, you're gonna have the virus, you're gonna have that virus your entire life, but that DNA will just sit inside and wait, wait for something to trigger it, like stress or UV light, and then it's gonna go the lytic route where you're gonna get, you know, the going all exploding and the stuff on your face there, but the lysogenic, it sits and waits. Okay, let's go over the living versus non-living. Remember, despite a lot of similar characteristics to cells, viruses are not alive. So if we were to take a look at virus versus cell, let's go through them. The basic structure, viruses, not much to them. DNA or RNA in a capsid, some have an envelope. Remember, it's like the M&M, the chocolatey goodness, the candy shell. Cells, however, got the cell membrane, cytoplasm, eukaryotes, have the nucleus, all those different organelles. Cells, way more complex. Viruses, not much to them. Reproduction. Viruses can't reproduce on their own. They have to be inside a host cell. Cells, they can definitely reproduce on their own. Nothing else needed. Independent cell division, they can either do it asexually or sexually. Genetic code. DNA or RNA. Cells, DNA only. So, you know, store one for viruses there. Growth and development. No, they don't grow. They don't develop. They just reproduce. Cells, yes. In multicellular organisms, they increase in number, they differentiate, they change. Viruses, no. Obtain and use energy, no. They do not eat, they do not poop. They just take over and reproduce. Cells, yeah, eating and pooping, that's what it's all about. Respond to the environment, no. Viruses have no idea what's going on. They're very, very dumb. With that being said, you can also still get sick from them, even though they're dumb. They just don't have the capacity to respond. There's nothing there to respond. Cells, they definitely do. They can move toward or away something. Viruses don't have that option. Change over time? Yep, they do. This is why you need a new flu shot every year. They are evolving. Same with cells. So, in our prokaryote and virus, not to scale. This one is about 100 times larger than that. Prokaryote, living. Virus, non-living. All right, so let's talk about some viral diseases. Influenza, gotta love that one. Everyone is uh, familiar with it, and it kills far more people than you would actually think. Get a flu shot. Airborne and direct contact. So you sneeze, you know, you're touching other stuff like that. People touch that, get that in their eyes, ears, nose, mouth, any of that stuff. That's how you're going to spread it. Common cold. Of course, that one is spread through airborne and direct contact. In case you're wondering how come you can't hear the common cold, that's because there is no common cold. There's like 200 different rhinoviruses, and each one can make you sick. HIV, of course, immunodeficiency virus. That one's spread by blood and sexual contact. I'll go into a really cool illustration of that in a second. Chicken pox, that one is spread through airborne, direct contact, and direct contact with lesions. This one we now have a vaccine for, so not really as big of an issue. HPV, human papillomavirus, causes cervical cancer in women. Sexual contact. Smallpox, that one is spread through airborne and direct contact. One of the worst human diseases of all time, but ha ha ha, not anymore. Smallpox, you dead now eliminated from the face of the planet, eradicated thanks to vaccines, and polio. That one is spread through the fecal-oral route, which, yep, that means what you think it is, poopy water, water and poop. 
Two things that shouldn't be together. Polio, almost eliminated. Just down to a couple countries left. I can't wait to have to update this video and say someday it will be eliminated. We're almost there. Vaccination is how we're doing it. So I want you to write down two viruses that spread through the air and two viruses that spread through sexual contact. Pause the video right now. All right, I want to show you guys this really cool picture that I found of HIV, the human immunodeficiency virus. Remember what viruses? We've got really two parts to it. We've got this outside, the candy shell, the capsid, and sometimes an envelope. And then the inside, you've got the chocolatey goodness of the M&M, the RNA or DNA genome. Now, HIV is a retrovirus, which means it goes from RNA backwards to DNA. So it's uh, an RNA genome in there. It's uh, a little bit different than the normal structure there. Got this other little part right here where you can kind of see, got this 3D structure going on. Really, really cool. I will have uh, a link to this website in the description. Just one last pun. Sir, I'm afraid you contracted one of the more literal strains of human rhinovirus. Oh, well, of course, if it was a real rhinovirus, you'd have like boogers and snot coming out of his rhino nose.